Well, welcome everyone. And today I have a very special guest. Her name is Aminata Kontabiga, who is joining us to talk about her very big life, her journey and what she's doing now. I'm sure you're going to be inspired because it has a lot to do with being a migrant, being a refugee, but being a woman and finding her place in a new country and building a new life with a new pet, new family and purpose. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're now doing now? So now I am the founder and the CEO of a non-profit organization called the Aminata Metona Foundation. The Aminata Metona Foundation work particularly in Sierra Leone, which is where I'm originally from. We, we work in reducing the infant and maternal mortality rate in, in Sierra Leone because Sierra Leone have the highest infant and uh, maternal mortality in the world. And then uh, where one in 17 women die through childbirth. So the foundation focused on reducing that. We're working with community and listening to community and the women there. And how have we been going as a foundation? So we've been, we've, we, the whole process starts eight years when I had my child in Australia here, I almost lost my daughter. So I, I did a sort of research for three years because I didn't really go into set up a foundation. I wanted to know why a mother and a, and a child, I would have died in Sierra Leone if I was mm -hmm. there. And then in Australia, I had seven doctors and then I registered 2014. And then um, 2016, we start, uh, We got our, our full um, tax deductible and all the process starting fund fundraising around 2016. So it's really your journey here yeah. of being able to have good medical help that made you aware of how appalling, um, and, well, just it's not there in your, in your country of birth. Was, would that be what happened for you? Absolutely. I think uh, for me, I, I just felt so blessed and so privileged that I had seven doctors in St. George Hospital to make sure that I survived. And I was looked after for four days when I was in the hospital. I had this special treatment. And then I started realizing, well, if me maternal health is not, it's not a disease, you don't need to find cure for a mother to have a safe birth. It's just the idea of, it's just the, the, the opportunity, the privilege of them going to the hospital and have a, a baby then I think that's something I can be part of that journey. It's not, I don't have to go study any scientist kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, or, or be a, a professor or anything like that. Uh, and, and then I just took it on board because I was very, my heart just felt like um, human rights should start from childbirth. So I mm. think that's what I went with in. So, so is the foundation doing well at the moment or it's still early days? It's still, it, it's doing really well. We've done remarkable well, um, but it's, it's in a place where we are, we are, we, we have to grow because I have done this work for eight years. Um, I only start getting paid like one day, oh, uh, uh, one day a week and I do it seven days and, and it's all based on volunteers and it's incredible. Um, I'm very grateful for my volunteers, but it's very, always tricky because with volunteers, they always live in, in, not giving you a, so it's all yeah so it's in a place where it needs to take go now to the to the next phase where it, i believe the australian community and the world to know what we're doing I've, we've sort of fundraised around family and friends and it doesn't really sustain a, a company like that and we are what we're doing is it's it's literally like life savings we're saving mothers and babies to have safe birth and, and be able to have a joyful experience. So I'm in a place where I'm at now is growing and getting to corporate and businesses to support because it's not really sustainable the way it's running. So, yes. Okay. So, so why don't you tell us about your life in your country of birth and your journey to Australia? How did all that unfold? So I grew up in Sierra Leone, uh, capital city of Freetown, with my with my father and three siblings. My my dad was a businessman that traveled overseas a lot in, in Europe and London, and we have other siblings there. So we lived with him, and I didn't grow up with my mother. And I grew up with the most incredible man who was very strong and um, showed us the value of um, loving ourselves and what beauty is, and beauty is from the inside. And also education was so important to him, especially for his daughters. He wanted us to be, to have education because he thought, he believed that with education, 
we can leave any part of the world and we will be able to look after ourselves without um, the need of somebody uh, uh, feeling to, to burden anyone. So, I, and he was very protective of his daughter. So I got very um, in this beautiful bubble that did not know what was happening in the outside world, went to, went to really good school, uh, had chauffeur, never did, did, did do much at home at all, just school and studying. And, and the war had been going on. We had a civil war that, that had been started from 1990. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, the rebels have been trying to get to the capital city, Frita, which is where I live. After uh, uh, years of trying, on, in 1999, um, January 6th, they finally entered the capital city. And I remember it was a school night and it was like around five, six o'clock and we just hear this sound. It was almost like a big echo sound from the cloud that we just heard and we woke up and it was smoke all around the place. And we looked through the window, we could just see people being burned in their houses, horrible things are happening. And my house was very big. It was a huge house in the community. And um, my dad let us live, he wanted us to live in a place where we see poverty, but we don't see people as poverty, we see them as people. So even though we had this really up class life, we, we, we saw my dad being really associating with people who were less fortunate, but we didn't see them as that. And so when the rebels enter the capital city, we, we had all these people came to our house to come hide. And I never understood why, because you never, when, when, when war is happening, you don't want to go to a big space. You want to go to a smaller space. Mm -hmm. And, and what was so incredible, all the houses around in our neighborhood has been burnt down. Our house that was the biggest house was the only one that was staying was a four story house and in, in two different parts. And we, we stayed there for, for a long time, seeing the horror of what was happening outside because of the window that we had was a, a tinted window was a bulletproof so we could see people from the outside but no one could see us from the inside and, 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 and see us in the inside so we but we were able to we were watching the horror that was happening and i remember when the rebel first came into the when they entered the city i remember my dad coming upstairs to us and i we knew that the reason why he was coming was that if anything was to happen we were we were supposed to die together so we were not, we, he didn't want us to run outside because they were burning houses and we could smell the body that, that had been burned. You can see people running. It, it, it's the most horror. How old were you again? I was 18. Mm, okay. And um, so, yeah, so that went on for weeks. And then finally, one, one day when it was getting really intense, we saw one of the rebels knock the door, the gate of our house and to ask to open and he, and we remember I heard we heard them saying if you do not come out we'll burn the house and everybody we all just came out and because that was very that what that was one of the signature part of the war they would burn you in the house or cut amputate your hand long sleeve or short sleeve they will ask which one you want and you have to choose whether they should cut your hand into a long short or long so uh, we knew all of this and we've heard all of what was happening so when we came out, my dad had Parkinson and he, his hand was shaking. So I, hold, I held my dad's hand and um, to stop the hands from shaking. And I remember just holding his hand and then I, 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 my eyes just locked in with one of the rebels and then he called me. So when he called, when he said, come here, I had to immediately let go of my dad's hands and, and walk away. And, and for me, in my story, that's been the hardest because I grew up with a, a man that protected me all my life. And then I had this, um, yeah, I just had this feeling of put this, this, this thing that came in me to protect him because I knew that if, if he fought or if I looked at him, he would fight. I didn't know what happened when I mm. walked away and that they would kill him or they would ask me to shoot him or they would, there, there were so many things that would have happened and I, I could not put my dad through that. So I just walked away with this rebel Darami and then um, that became my journey. So my first experience or intimacy with a man was I was raped by seven men for the first time. Um, and then for those several months, that was my life. Oh. 
That's just awful. I'm so sorry that happened. How long did it take you? I guess she's still dealing with that trauma. Is it, would that be true? Is it something, I mean, I can hear the emotion in your voice. Yeah, my, my dad's story always hit me, uh, um, uh, uh, really hit me, because for, for parents, just for there's one thing for your child to be kidnapped away from you when you did not see, mm. or he, he was there and he was... My dad was incredible protective of his, his daughters. His daughters were so precious. All his children were his daughters. So that really, uh, even when I was kidnapped, when I was going through all those hard times, I was worried about my father all the time. I was worried about him. And when I came back, he was not the same person. And I, and I really, and I just felt he was gone. Um, he was not the same man. The father that we know, he was chubby and, and, mm. and, and, and this beautiful smile and this proudness in his eyes. It, they've taken everything from him and, and he knew they've taken something from me. So he was never the same person. And um, yeah, but the horror of the what I went through, that is always what I've always said. That's part of my, that's always part of my life. I'm always going to be part of my life. And I think I've managed in, to be in control of it because I feel like I own my story. My story doesn't own me. So I've been able to navigate through life, choosing joy and choosing happiness, whatever is happening every any day in life. Um, I, I knew that I have a choice to choose. It's difficult, it's not, um, it's not rainbow, uh, but I, I have this decision in my hands. So yeah. was, there a, was there a moment where you were able to say, I'm going to choose joy. I'm not going to be defined by this evil, evil behavior, but I'm going to live my life as an empowered woman. Was it? Was there a moment that you were aware of that? I, I, I think I was. I was very aware of that from the moment when, when, when the war happened. When I was kidnapped, every day I was fighting to survive. Why would I fight to survive? I think for me that's always been the question. I fought to live. I did the most. I, I grew up in a bubble. Some of the some of the skills that I that it that I came up with to survive was incredible. I don't even think I did it. So for me, the need to do that, to go to that extreme, to do that, and to be able to come, to even leave and be able to free the way I was released and then go home and be safe. But also even having this captive, my the person that kidnapped me was still looking for me. That's how I came to Australia. I, I could not leave, I cannot live any day without in, in, in craving for joy. I don't look for happiness, I look for joy because I feel like joy is everlasting. And 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 I know that it's a choice, it's a decision, it's a practice. Um, things happen all the time. But from them, every time I think of how I fought for to live and to, to breathe, it makes me, it, it gives me a, a new purpose every time, every time. Amazing. So, so um, you lived in a refugee camp, would that be correct or? I didn't. I didn't live in a refugee camp. I, w I visited a refugee camp in Guinea Conakry a lot. My mom lives in Guinea Conakry. So I live with my mother, but I could not really go out as much because I, when I, from the moment I was released, I, I realized that the person that kidnapped me was still looking for me. So I was still isolated in Guinea. But I went to camps and see how people live in the camps. But I was I was in prison also in myself in my own body. Yeah. In, for very long time because I was hiding from this person. This this man was very obsessed with me because he believed that because when I when he raped me, I have never been with a man before. So he believed that I was meant to be with him. So when when the UN United Nations High Commissioner refugee find out knew of my story, they all they, they tried to really get me out of the country as quick as as fast as possible. Right. So so um, so there was a sense of ownership that the perpetrator had over you that was determined to hold on to you and not let you go. It's, very, it's a very common story with domestic and family violence. There's, mm. there's so many parallels. What, what made you choose a charity that was completely different to that? You know, it was all about new life and new beginnings because many people that have been through a really horrible traumatic experience choose to go and work in that area and try and make change, but you've chosen a completely different pathway. Well, I think it's because I, I, I feel, I felt like I, I've been involved with UNHCR. I'm an ambassador for UNHCR and I see the support it's getting and UNICEF and all these other organizations. 
And um, for me, I, I don't know, I had this feeling that the moment I give, I have my child or give birth, I'll find my purpose. And, and, and that's what happened. I think as life goes, you have to go through some things again for you to find your calling and your purpose. So once I found that, I knew, I, I didn't know any organization that was working in Sierra Leone in maternal health. And firstly, I was in a country like Australia. Nobody knows where Sierra Leone is. So I was pretty shocked about that because I am a living example of what they've gone through. So when I, once I found out uh, um, that there's no organization that does what, what, what in, work in maternal health in Sierra Leone, and Sierra Leone had the highest by in 2012, it was one in eight women that would die through childbirth. And I think for me, it, it just gave me a shock, but also it motivates me. And I, and I, in a way, I knew it was difficult, but I didn't know it was going to be that difficult at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I remember saying to myself, I want to build a hospital. I want to do this. And I'm, I'm a really, uh, our words are very important to me. So I speak words through my kids, my life, my family, my home, my friends. Words are very powerful. So I said that. And I knew it was going to come to life. I know nothing is impossible. I knew it was difficult, but it's difficult because it's important to do, you know. So I wanted I wanted to go to a place where um, sort of the, um, the, the 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 place where people don't hear about so much in Sierra Leone about Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and people don't want to go there. People do not want to go there. So I don't want to be one of those persons that go like, let me find something else. <laughs> that is very that is very that that is very everybody knows Ethiopia and all Uganda Rwanda everybody talk about this country but a country like ours that have gone through 11 years of civil war Ebola and everything and I go like I can be that voice to for people to know about my country and know about these incredible souls that are that are so so uh, full of resilience I wake up every morning and find joy. So really, that, that's what motivates me to do it. I would have done it in any country, but, and it's not just because it's my homeland, but I think it's because it's so neglected. It's, a, it's, a, it's forgotten. It's mm. totally forgotten. And I think one voice can raise thousands. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, ripple. the ripple effect. Yeah. So, so how have you dealt with the trauma? Have you, I mean, have you done a lot of therapy and a lot of extra support to get through that? When I came to Australia as African and as Sierra Leone, I would say Sierra Leone, not generalize it, but as African, well, a lot of culture, we don't do counseling. Right. And we, don't know, we don't know what that is. I don't even know what the word trauma was. I remember, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't. I, I remember at UNH here, they would say, she's trauma. I'm like, what is that word? So I didn't even pay attention to that because we, we they, a lot of people have gone through so much, a lot, a lot of community and country, like they, they're immune to things. They just follow on with life and move forward with life. So when I when I came, I remember seeing a counselor at school because they wanted me to say counselor. I'm like, okay. Um, and I remember this lady saying to me all the time when we talk, when I meet with her, she would say to me, I understand what you've gone through. And that was a total, sh I didn't, even if I didn't understand English that much, it was such a shock to me because I felt like maybe she was there with me in the war <laughs> for her to understand what, I don't even understand what I've gone through. How can you understand what you've gone through? So then I realized, okay, this is the word that they say or they're supposed to say. So I went to see her for six months, did not say a word because I just could not understand what she's saying. And um, I did. I only saw counseling when I was doing the Bokam Hills African Ladies Troop. Yeah. Um, Rose was somebody that listened, that really hear, and I think we, we lose that part of listening to somebody's need and took the time. So I was able to say counselor, but um, I have a really interesting uh, uh, relationship with my counselor. She's incredible. We have this, I always feel like counseling is, they're not, I knew straight away they were not there to fix me because nobody could fix me. And I, I know that I, I didn't feel a sense of brokenness at all in me. I just, I just didn't know how to navigate the emotion, what I was feeling and how I could express that. I knew already there were certain decisions that I've made in life that if I was going to marry the man, that man has to know everything that I've gone through and they cannot be ashamed of what I've been through. That, because shame and, and, and um, blame is what happened when you've been uh, abused. 
And I didn't want, that is something that I could not carry with me, somebody else to feel ashamed. And I knew from an African man point of view, that would be the case. So there's certain decision that I made when I came to Australia, but my counselor and I, I knew that we had a, we always have a conversation and I, I, she always said to me, I feel like, she feel like I'm counselling her also. So it was a place to, to be heard and then go on and, 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 and start to move forward with life. But as I said before, my story, I'm never away from my story. I'm never shy away from it. I'm never embarrassed of it. I own it. So whenever it shows up, I'm always there to embrace it because it is part of who I am. And I, I have made that, that agreement that it's never going to go away. So um, I control it in a way, not forcing to control it. So when I tell my story, I will tell it and I feel maybe a bit exhausted, but I don't go on thinking about it. I never go on thinking about my story. I don't know how I've done it, but I think it's ownership. I own it. You know, yeah. it doesn't own me. It's very interesting because the first impression I have of you of somebody who's incredibly proud of who they are, that's what comes across. And I hope that, do, hope that does to our viewers as well. And I guess some of that must come from your dad, the, the way you've spoken about him, like he's so proud of his daughters. And by you going with that man, it was an act of love. You were protecting your dad. And it just sounds as though that was just what was necessary in that moment. And I'm not diminishing how terrible it was, but yes. it's extraordinary um, that you're talking to me like this with such a sense of who you are. It, it, I hope it's inspiration to other people. Um, how, how have you rebuilt your life here? I mean, was it really hard to start again? Oh, it was incredible. It was a shock. <laughs> It was, it was a total shock. I was so, I actually deliberately chose Australia. Um, UN wanted to get me to Canada because the program was going faster. This was 2000, so over 20 years. And I, and I chose Australia because, again, I've never heard of Australia before. I don't even know where this country is. <laughs> I, yes, I thought it was Austria because the, in Guinea Conakry, they call Australia, Australia. So I'm thinking like, oh, it must be Austria. <laughs> And I thought to her, I'm like, oh, this place, Austria, must, Austria is cold. Because I know of Austria. So I'm like, Austria is cold, but I'm going to go anyway. So I was part of the first refugee resettlement group that came. I have no idea. I came to a house that they got us for us in Wally Park that was totally empty, which was not a story that we've been told. We had to go straight away and get food. But there were so many things I didn't understand about the country. And there was no this country and there was no resettlement program then this is 20 years ago so there was a lot of struggle but it was a combination of struggle that i didn't even i've not come in time of what i've gone through and now i'm here and i was missing my father terribly because he was in london having treatment and my sister that i came with we are both sort of switched sort of life because i have gone through this experience and she went on straight away go to university had a good job she was living and I was just, I had to go to school. I was 20 years old and I had to go back all the way to 16 to go to year nine. Oh because the UN, yes, the UN has changed. So, and then I realized, oh, in, at school, because I was living in, in, in Pences. So around that area, my school, I was the only black girl. And, and then I realized like, oh, I'm black. I didn't notice I was a black, I didn't know I was black girl. <laughs> Because everybody was so damn curious about my skin color. Everybody was curious about my hair. And I was like, I was fascinated that they were fascinated about me. And then I realized, so I started learning a lot about, I didn't even know about slavery. I didn't know about racism. So everything was coming all at me. And I believe for me, my state was one thing that kept me grounded and kept me whole. That that's something that I've had with me during the war. So... As I'm learning how to navigate and people are asking me questions, have you seen lion? Do you live next to a lion or elephant? And I used to and I used to say to people, no, I saw lion when I came to Tarango Zoo in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, so I was going through all this experience that I didn't know where to put them. But one thing I've always, my father always taught me that I've had with me was to, I, I was always happy to be by myself. I was, so I, I still, what I did was I didn't stay home. I'll go to school, I'll go to church, but I will always take that step to go out. So I will always go out. I love the movies. It's where, how I used to spend time with my dad. 
So I'll go to the movies. I love watching for, foreign movies. But I, yes, I, I just really push myself to get into the Australia lifestyle because I'm one person that believe that home is everywhere, home is nowhere. So when I when I was when I'm in Australia, I, I want to know the Australian culture. So for me, I had to go and search for it and learn every every so it was difficult i think now with the book when i've written it people are like how do you leave i'm like i just lived <laughs> <You know? laughs> i just i just made it work but it was it was a place where i found starvation i've never starved in my life apart from the war so australia i had 250 70 dollars that was paying my rent my food my everything i was doing on my own and I, I think that that was um, a shock but because my father has really taught me that he really taught us that money, we sh- it's good to have money, but we should be happy with or without money. So I was striving every day and um, I went to church is where I met my spiritual father, uh, Michael Dwyer, who is the chair for unit chair, also fits a uh, was the CEO for First Day Superannuation. Really, they were the family that I needed and they were the one that just loved me and saw my light. And we never spoke about my story. Only when he read the book now, we ever spoke. So I was a family, that I was a person that belonged to their family. He, every time people see me in the street, you're Michael Dwyer's daughter and he's purely, fully white man. And he's so <laughs> proud, you know? And I, and, I, and, I, and that family was something that became my saving grace also to, to really guide me through life and show me through love. And all. my story was not in the center of their conversation. Not once any one of them ever asked me. Only, again, when, she, when he finished reading the book and then he, 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 he just, it was just, I think he had to sit with it for a very long time to know that that's what I've gone through. But yeah. I think that's how I, that, yeah, that's how I've always, um, navigate myself through life so so um was it hard i mean you've written a book and you've just mentioned that and we'll show some vision uh with that rising heart thank you how long did it take you to write was it hard given you had to go back into your story that must have been difficult because you know i i i I see you as a person who's constantly moving forward so it would have been a time of intense reliving what had happened it was. It was a time. Um, it was really difficult. But I, again, I, I've been in a really blessed place. My book went on auction. I had a company bidding for it. And wow. I, yeah, it went. It, it was. It was. It was incredible. So I was in this place once again where I had control of my story. I had to choose. So I chose Pan McMillan, and I. I don't think I'll ever regret it because it was the best relationship I saw through what they would want me to become in my story. Because for me, it was really, it's really important that I become consistent and I tell my truth. So I knew that they would allow me to do that. And um, not knowing, and I had, I had an agency that represented me in every way and let me, allowed me to choose and voice my opinion. And so when, when it was time to choose a ghostwriter also, I had a choice to interview about four or five ghostwriters. I chose that person. And I, I also wanted to choose somebody that will allow me to be, to be free. I like to be free. I don't like to be tamed. <laughs> I, I like to be, because I know in the West, there, there's so many tameness. You can't be you. You have to be robotic. I do not like that. I can I can tell my story more when I'm when I'm loose, when I'm free, when I'm laughing, when I'm crying. And I didn't want somebody that will write help me write my story that will think of me as a, a broken vessel. Yeah. And my my ghostwriter was that person, the one that I chose, Juliet Redden. I'll cry sometimes. I'll be in a big cry. She will never stop me, and I like that. She would make me continue to tell the story. I'll still continue to do the recording. And I didn't want somebody to stop me because once you stop me, I can't go back there. So a lot of things I never really thought of. A lot of things came back. Uh, when, you, when you read the book, most a lot of people that I will be mentoring on the book, they, she has interviewed them. She traveled with me to Sierra Leone. Yeah. She met all my family in London, my mom, my sisters. So the stories are really coming from those people in my voice though. So I wanted that true to be in it. I wanted to hear my mom's pain as how she didn't raise me. I'm the only child. And my father didn't let her raise me. I wanted, I, she asked for my permission. I think that was 
hurtful to the guy. He wanted to ask for my permission, and and I wanted to tell. I want to tell the story. I wanted to feel to express for the first time as an African woman who she, they would normally not do. I wanted her to feel what she felt of not raising her only child, and and knowing that she has to know that I would never not love my dad. I love my dad more than anything in this world. So so that really was really important to me. Somebody that would follow me through my journey that will allow me and see me be the person that I, I, I'm always, I always am. So it was difficult. It was joyous. It was all mix of emotion, which is what we as human are when we are allowed to be. So, yeah. Absolutely. So I have to ask this and I really hope I get a nice answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you found racism difficult in Australia or you know, have you encountered it much? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. Sadly. I yeah. hate hearing that. Yeah. I know. Sadly, I think, um, as I said, racism, racism was shock for me. It took me a long time for me to understand what racism is. Yeah. It really took me a while. And um, I didn't understand the history behind it too. So Sierra Leone, slavery started from Sierra Leone. I didn't know that. I didn't learn that at school. So until I started meeting people like Maya Angelou here in Muhammad Ali, I loved Muhammad. We loved Muhammad Ali in Africa, but I didn't know what he'd gone through. So when I came to Australia, when I was, I talked about that in the book because for me it was important to for Australia to hear this story, and and know and know that this this is what people go through anymore. We have this open conversation; people are aware. I think for uh, for Australia. Um, I went, I went through that and I'm still going to go through that. It's not something that I believe it's going to end completely. But um, I was, because I, I was taught, I was brought up by such self-confidence. It mm -hmm. protected me really. And I passed that on to my children. I have two children. It really protected me because my dad will always say, your appearance is very important. When you go to a room, you are the most important person in that room and you are not important than anybody else. I should know that. So whenever I, I used to face racism, I always think like, ah, okay, this person have an issue. That's not my issue. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it really, yeah, it never really, it never really, but it affects me. I remember when I was like, I went to Cornella Beach one time and I saw this person moved. I understand why they were moving. And I didn't go to Cornella Beach for years. And I had that same experience in, at Manly Beach, Manly Beach. I didn't go for years. So it does affect you because even though I was going on living my life, but there were places that were like, okay, that means I should not go there. You know, it took me a long time to go to those places. But I think the most um, experience, in racism that I experienced, it's really the, the, the systematic, the, the, in Australia, I say the polite, sort of polite racism. Yeah. They're very, it's very polite when they, when they, when, when they make, when somebody's making you feel small or doubting who you are, your capacity, your brilliantness, or your, your being, or thinking of you less, because you can't really react. Because when you react, you are seen as that person that is really overreacting for something that doesn't make any sense because they're being nice. Yeah, yeah. I, so I mean, I Sorry, I, I guess yes. I would like to share when the Black Lives Matter movement first came out, I mean, everyone was so angry and it didn't matter what color anyone's skin was, it was just appalling. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, white supremacy or white attitudes or whatever you want to call it, you know, we know better and the Black Lives Matter, excuse me, we're not going to educate you, go away and read books, it's not up to yes. us. And I went into, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Like I yeah. don't, you know, is is there something you can say to people that that really want to embrace people more but a, a bit frightened of saying the wrong thing well i think it, it's saying the wrong thing escaping or saying the wrong thing will make you still think of the wrong thing there's no wrong and right answer i think when you make those mistakes it's about being better i think the one thing that i, I believe that a lot of white people take for for stuff is like they are being nice People don't want you to be nice. They want it to be better. You, we have to be better. We can't be nice. So if you're saying, oh, I don't want to say that to Aminata because I, I might be racist or I don't want to offend, then the relationship is always not going to be 100%. That's true. That's true. Because then when we make those mistakes, is the, that's when we learn more. Because we're all coming from a place of learning. There's so many things that I'm going to say to people that are wrong. And if you're coming from a good intention place and you have to be ready also when you're corrected, that's the problem. 
if somebody called you out, are you going to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to be better. I'm going to learn not to make the same mistake again. That's the issue. People don't want to take that responsibility. Oh, I said, so for me, I have 99 on 95% of my friends are Australian. Most of them say things sometimes, <laughs> a lot of times, uh, probably a lot of them say, uh, like a lot of them say things sometimes. But I'm always, I'm in a place now where the Black Lives Matter happened. I remember holding this um, this quote from uh, Angela Davis. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. But now I am changing the things I cannot accept anymore. So now when somebody said to me anything, I'll say, I'll, I'll make sure I'm not there to educate you. But I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly how that makes me feel. Uh, because, yeah, yes. So, and I'm not saying it from an anger way. I'm saying it from a way that as soon as you're here to listen, yeah. I'll tell how that makes me feel. And then we, we the conversation continue. But the thing about Australia, once you said that to people, it's almost like the friendship is over. Yes, yeah, that's the yeah. other thing. So this is the this is the, always the like uh, always the the, the the issue. Like somebody said to me, or uh, somebody said to me, um, uh, excuse my ignorance. And I stopped the person right there. I'm like, okay, you're not really ignorant if you <laughs> your ignorance before you ask me a question about ignorance question. Because if you want to invest in in gorilla in in Rwanda or painting, you put so much effort in learning that. Why don't you put effort in learning about something and come with me with what you've learned? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. taking the time to learn about me. So so I am doing that now and it's not educating, it's just saying, well, that what you said, that wasn't you can't you, you that wasn't right. But if you want to say it, you gotta say it in that way, or you're looking at me in that. So uh, a lot of things that I had to go through in Australia is always people saying, You're so grateful to have that person in your life. And for a long time, that was really eating me up because I had to take it. I had to take it because I wanted to move forward mm -hmm. with the foundation. And that was beautiful because I set up the foundation. I built it. I created it. I day and night with my kids. I, I am on Centrelink. I have done everything. But the per I have to have a white person next to me. And when they're talking about my story and somebody pop, pop up and said, oh, you're so lucky to have that person. And I know what it meant. Mm -hmm. Mm, and that it. was that was really killing me because I'm doing the work. It's not that I'm not grateful. I'm grateful for having everybody in my life. Mm. But it was more coming from a, a, a degrading place. And I have yes. to tell my friend, my friend that says it all the time. I have to say to her, do not ask I said, did you read my book? And she read my book like three times. I'm like, did you even understood what I'm trying to say? Stop saying to me repeatedly, because that's I know what you're saying. You're saying Ami can't be without that person but I can be without, I can be because I was created to be this person. So I think it's having this conversation, the uncomfortable conversation. I think a lot of, I believe white people don't, they're scared to have because, and the truth can be uncomfortable, but the truth can make us grow and learn. And I, and I think that's where we have to be now. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, what comes across in this conversation is your personal power, and I've said it now probably three times in this conversation, is people do make mistakes and many of them are really unintended and they don't want to offend or, but it's just through not knowing and by actually sharing, that yeah. makes me feel that it gives, as you say, an opportunity for someone to learn and yes. to do it and do it better and hopefully have another conversation with somebody else and say, yes. <laughs> I said this and I didn't realise, <laughs> you know, which yeah. is healthy, which is healthy. So two last questions. I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> what does spirituality mean to you? Spirituality for me means to me is being, being able to sit with myself and able to recognize that I am here and I'm here for, to be, to be um, connected to uh, the uh, humans and, 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 plants and the big the nature that we have in this world and being uh, spirituality means that i am able to to love myself more than anybody else because you can only give love when you have love and spirituality means that i'm able to listen and uh, empathy and and gratitude so i always say i sit in the seat of gratitude and empathy because it makes me understand or feel try to understand what the next person is feeling so that that is where i sit on so with spirituality being 
and able to uh, really give that back to, to the world, knowing that I'm, uh, yeah. Wonderful. And what about how do you look after yourself? How do you practice self-care? Self-care, I practice self-care by being alone. I'm always around people, but I love being by myself. Do you? Uh, Yes, I love being by myself. I wake up 5.30 in the morning to go for a run or walk and listen to a lot of um, pod, uh, podcasts about um, um, about giving and about love, about anything positive, anything good. It's not even positive, anything that is of good and being better. I want to be better every single day. So for me, self-care is really, even with my children, I always say to people, I love myself before I love my children because they feed from me. And, and, and they get every, they, they learn from what I am giving, what I'm showing some, uh, somebody else. So I, I really love that. I, my, when it comes to my birthday or when I've achieved something, I reward myself if it's dinner. And I'm one of those people that you see having a nice dinner by yourself. I'm not waiting for <laughs> somebody else. Um, I, I love it. I love looking after myself. I love myself. I, I really do because I believe that's how I show people how to treat me, even with my husband. So um, I think that's extremely important because there's nobody in this world that can love you better than you. And once you have that, you're able to give so much more, so much more. So that is really what I've stand by for forever, for a very long time. Yeah. So thank you for sharing such a, a really beautiful story. I mean, I've, I've gone away. It's going to make my day. Like I, I'm, I'm on a happiness bubble. Do you want to hold your book up and show us all one more time? So everybody, this is out, Rising Heart. Um, it'll make a great holiday gift. Um, it's available, obviously, in any good bookstore, online. And um, what's your website again? My website, it's risingheart.com. Dot .au. All right. And people can support you with a donation? Yes, you can go to, for the Aminata Metano Foundation. Is the, if you if they Google Aminata Metano Foundation.org, they'll find us. And, um, and yeah, I do a lot of talks, a lot of speaking. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm around if anybody needs me. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Bye. so very much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Have a blessed week.